We are counting down the 10 steam engines that were not just retired, they were outlawed, blacklisted, or erased by law, by memo, or by sheer nightmare fuel. From machines so heavy they bent the tracks to experiments so lethal that Congress itself had to step in, this list exposes each moment ingenuity went too far, and the rulebook had to be rewritten. Some faced quiet exile, others triggered national bans. Which engine crossed the final line? Let us begin with number 10. Erie Railroad's Triplex was the kind of machine that made accountants nervous. Built between 1914 and 1916 by Baldwin, this 28882 behemoth was supposed to solve a coal hauling problem in one stroke. Instead of using three locomotives to shove a train over Gulf Summit, Erie wanted one monster to do the job. What they got was a rolling paradox. Triple the engine, but not triple the power. The triplex could pull a mountain, but only at walking speed. Above 8 miles an hour, the boiler simply could not keep up with the steam demand. Maintenance crews watched as tie replacement rates doubled along the Susquehanna division, and repair bills stacked up almost as fast as the coal cars. The company's own operating reports painted a clear picture. More time in the shop than on the rails, more money spent than saved. Within a decade, Erie quietly pulled the plug. No government stepped in, no law was passed, just an internal memo and a lesson, sometimes the bottom line is the most effective ban of all. The Virginian. AE Class 21010 arrived in 1918, and from the start the numbers alone told the story. Engine and tender together tipped the scales at nearly a million pounds. With 61,000 pounds pressing down on each driving axle, these locomotives were simply too heavy for most American rails. Standard branch lines and interchange tracks would have cracked under their weight. The AE was engineered for a single purpose, to shove massive coal drags over the brutal grades of West Virginia. But that muscle came with a price. Virginians' own clearance charts and Alco's technical specs set a hard floor. Only the heaviest main line with 103-pound rail could handle the load. Even the tenders were trimmed short just to fit the company's biggest turntables. Dispatch orders kept the AE confined to a 133-mile corridor between the mines and Roanoke. No other railroad would touch them. There was no law, no public ban. Just a company verdict. Too big to roam, too heavy to share. By 1955, every AE was off the rails for good. Their world was reduced to a single stretch of track they could never escape. In 1931, German engineers rolled out a machine that looked like a fever dream, the Schienen Zeppelin. It was a streamlined railcar pushed not by pistons or gears, but by a roaring wooden propeller mounted at the rear. On open track, it was unstoppable. The Schienen Zeppelin smashed the world rail speed record, hitting 230 km per hour, faster than any train had ever gone. But the real story was not about speed. It was about what happened when this machine met the public. The propeller swept a lethal arc three meters beyond the car body, right at platform height. Anyone standing too close risked being sucked into the blades, or worse. Imagine a giant blender the size of a bus, with its blades at shoulder level. Railway officials saw the danger immediately. Test runs were limited to quiet rural lines, far from crowded stations. The press marveled, but safety inspectors wrote warnings. No one wanted a crowd to meet a spinning propeller. The Sheenan Zeppelin was never certified for passenger service. There was no federal law, no grand decree. There was a quiet understanding, enforced by local operating rules, that this machine would never be allowed near a busy platform. In the end, the paperwork killed it. The records show a marvel of engineering, sidelined by the simplest rule in railroading, don't bring a hazard into the crowd. Camelback locomotives were born out of a compromise, an attempt to burn cheap anthracite waste known as culm using the enormous Wooten firebox. To fit that firebox, the cab had to be perched mid-boiler, straddling the machinery like a shack on stilts. The engineer sat alone, just inches from moving rods and the constant threat of a boiler explosion, while the fireman worked at the rear, isolated and out of sight. 
Communication was a shouted gamble over the roar of steam. Safety bulletins from the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers tell the rest. In collision after collision, the center cab became a death trap, torn away, crushed, or simply vaporized, taking the engineer with it. State railroad commissions took notice as the accident reports piled up. By the late 19-teens, minutes from commission meetings and union petitions called for an end to new construction. The verdict came not with a bang, but with a clause. Existing camelbacks could run out their days, but no more would be built. The last of them clung to life into the diesel era. Ghosts on the roster, grandfathered until the scrap line called. For every engineer who climbed into that exposed cab, the ban arrived too late. The paperwork caught up only after the bodies did. Southern Pacific's engineers faced a problem as old as the Sierra Tunnels themselves, smoke. On a traditional steam locomotive, the crew rode behind the stack, so every tunnel or snowshed became a gas chamber. Their answer was radical. In the 1920s, they flipped the entire design. The cab went to the front, ahead of the boiler, putting the crew out in the clean air while the smoke trailed behind. The AC-class cab forwards, some of the largest articulated engines ever built, hauled freight over Donner Pass and through the Tehachapi Mountains where tunnels could stretch for miles. For decades, these monsters ran day and night, their crews breathing easier even as the rest of California choked on soot. But clever engineering couldn't outrun the bigger picture. As cities grew, so did complaints about smoke and cinders. Urban boards of health started drafting ordinances. The Southern Pacific's own circulars show a timeline. By the late 1940s, diesel-electric engines were taking over the tunnels and terminals. The last AC-class cab forward was retired in 1958. There was no single ban, no dramatic showdown, just a wave of dieselization and a new era of air quality politics. The cab forward didn't break the law, but it couldn't survive the policy tide. When the company switched off the last boiler, the verdict was clear. Solving one hazard didn't save you from the next one. Not every outlaw gets handcuffs. Sometimes the law just changes the locks. On a gray January morning in 1902, a New York Central Express slammed into a commuter train inside the Park Avenue tunnel. Smoke filled the air, visibility dropped to zero, and 15 people died before the rescue crews could even see what had happened. For decades, Manhattan's north to south artery had been a rolling chimney, with steam locomotives belching soot and cinders through the city's most expensive neighborhoods. Residents filed complaints, doctors testified about choking smog, and the Board of Health held hearings as the city's air turned toxic. The press demanded action. In Albany, lawmakers responded with the kind of language engineers dread, absolute, unambiguous, and final. The New York State Legislature passed a law barring steam locomotives from operating south of 42nd Street after July 1, 1908. The text left no loopholes. It did not matter how new the engine was or how cleanly it burned. Steam was simply outlawed on Park Avenue and in the tunnels leading to Grand Central. Railroads had six years to electrify or get out. The New York Central scrambled to string wires and build new electric trains, but the deadline held. When the clock struck midnight on June 30, 1908, the last legal puff of steam vanished from Manhattan's heart. For the first time, a state had drawn a hard line between public health and railroad tradition. The verdict was written in statute. Steam was now a crime below 42nd Street. Oliver Bullard's leader was supposed to be the steam engine for a new era, one that could run in both directions, look like a diesel, and keep the soot and grease off the crew. Instead, it became a case study in how paperwork can kill a machine faster than any law. Built at Brighton Works in 1949, the leader's body was a slab-sided box that hid an offset boiler and a chain drive sealed in an oil bath. The idea was simple, protect the moving parts, cut down on maintenance, and make steam as modern as possible. British Railways, newly nationalized and eager to prove its efficiency, signed off on five prototypes. Trial reports painted a different picture. The enclosed body trapped heat and fumes, turning the cab into an oven. 
The chain drive, meant to be the heart of the system, leaked oil and demanded constant attention. Maintenance crews complained about cramped access and unpredictable failures. The ride was rough, the suspension unpredictable. Every test run stacked up more reasons to stop the project. By late 1951, with the modernization plan steering the country toward diesels and electrics, the administrative axe fell. The British Railways Board met, reviewed the damning reports, and issued a quiet order. Cancel the leader, scrap the prototypes, and close the file. No act of parliament, no public scandal. Just a national railway using its own authority to erase a failed experiment from the roster. In a system where the bureaucracy holds the keys, a boardroom verdict can be just as final as any statute. In 1934, Soviet engineers at Kolomna Works unveiled something that looked more like a rolling bridge than a locomotive. The AA-21 was classified as 4-14-4, a wheel arrangement that translated to seven coupled driving axles and a rigid wheelbase stretching to 33 meters. The plan was simple, move more freight with one locomotive, spreading the weight across more wheels to avoid crushing the rails. But physics had other ideas. On paper, the AA-21 could haul anything the Soviet Union could throw at it. In reality, it was a mechanical contradiction. The rigid frame fought every curve, forcing the outer wheels to grind against the rails. The center axles were built flangeless, intended to float through turns, but the result was a locomotive that barely fit the geometry of its own tracks. Columna test reports show stress lines radiating through rails and ties, with lateral forces that exceeded what 78-pound rail could handle. Even at low speeds, the AA-21 bent rails, chewed up switches, and threatened to derail itself on routine curves. Maintenance crews watched the track twist under the locomotive's weight. Turntables buckled, yardmasters refused to let it near junctions. After a handful of test runs, the engine was quietly mothballed in 1935. No production order followed. The design was not outlawed by a decree or by law. It was vetoed by the realities of steel, wood, and geometry. The official verdict came in the form of silence. One prototype, never repeated, condemned by the Technical Bureau as impossible for service. In the Soviet system, that was all it took. The AA-21 was banned not by policy, but by the laws of physics. By the late 1950s, nuclear power was crawling out of laboratories and into every pitch meeting. Ships, planes, maybe even a locomotive that would never need to refuel. On paper, a nuclear-powered train could pull a freight across continents without stopping for coal or water. Proposals landed on the desks at the Atomic Energy Commission and at the Pentagon. Blueprints for a rolling reactor shielded with tons of lead trundling through city centers and farm towns alike. The technical studies got grim fast. Shielding alone would have doubled the locomotive's weight. A single derailment could scatter radioactive fuel over miles of track, poisoning land and water. Sabotage scenarios filled classified memos, a bomb, a collision, a cracked containment vessel. No insurance company would touch it. Congressional hearings in the early 1960s grilled experts on every nightmare. What if the train jumped the rails in a city? What if terrorists targeted the reactor? The answers were always the same. Too risky, too heavy, too catastrophic to contemplate. No prototype was ever built. The Atomic Energy Commission refused to issue a license and the Department of Defense closed the file. The verdict arrived before the first weld Nuclear power would never ride the rails in the United States. Not a single bolt was tightened. In the world of banned steam, this was the ultimate preemptive strike. Federal safety agencies killed the project at the drawing board with a stamp of denial. When the risk is national security, the hammer comes down before the machine even exists. Lincoln pin couplers were a simple idea, just a heavy iron link and a vertical pin dropped in by hand to connect two rail cars. But in the hands of railroad brakemen, they became a machine for maiming. Every coupling meant stepping into the narrow gap between cars, wrestling with stubborn iron, and hoping the cars did not lurch at the wrong moment. Thousands of workers lost fingers, hands, or their lives, crushed as cars rolled together without warning. 
The annual reports from the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen and the Congressional Record in the late 1880s are filled with stories of men caught between cars, arms mangled, bodies broken. By 1890, the United States Department of Labor estimated that over 2,000 railroaders died on the job each year, with coupler accidents accounting for a brutal share. Union petitions piled up in Washington. Brotherhood sent delegations and testimony to the Capitol, demanding that Congress put an end to the bloodshed. The numbers were impossible to ignore, tens of thousands of injuries year after year and a mounting toll of amputations. In 1893, lawmakers finally acted. The Safety Appliance Act, signed into law as 27 Statute 531, made it illegal for any railroad engaged in interstate commerce to operate cars without automatic couplers and air brakes. The law did not just set a future date and walk away. It imposed fines for every non-compliant car, no matter how old or beloved. Inspectors from the Interstate Commerce Commission were given the power to audit rolling stock. The law made clear the era of risking life and limb with every coupling was over. The transition was not instant. Railroads fought for delays, pleading poverty and the scale of the refit. But the compliance deadlines held. By 1900, most of the country's railcars had been retrofitted or scrapped and the Lincoln Pin Coupler was officially outlawed from American mainline service. The Safety Appliance Act stands as the ultimate legal hammer in railroad history, a federal statute that did not just end a machine, but rewrote the rules of the industry. No more loopholes, no more grandfathering, no more blood on the ballast. For the first time, Congress drew a line in the sand and made it a crime to run a railroad the old deadly way. Across all 10 cases, one pattern dominates. When ambition outruns control, the law becomes the last line of defense. These outlaw engines prove technology is not always progress. Sometimes it is a threat we have to outlaw to survive. Even today, every new invention faces the same question. Will this creation serve us or force us to write new rules? Progress always comes with a caution sign. Which machine shocked you most?